All right, Pit Hoops is in a little bit of a break here for finals. They don't have a game between Saturday and Saturday. So we got a little time to talk about the Basketball Panthers, what we've learned out of the first 10 games, what we think about them heading forward into the second two-thirds of the season with really the bulk of the schedule coming up. So let's talk a little Pit Hoops on the morning pit. I got about seven thoughts or so, maybe more, maybe less. We'll see how many we can get in. Right here on the morning pit, the Wednesday edition on YouTube.com slash Panthers.com. I was going to open the uh, show with the, uh, did you ever see the SNL skit of John Tesh auditioning round ball, round ball rock for the NBC executives, but it's not just John Tesh who's Jason Sudeikis, but it's, uh, uh, he's got his, his brother, Dave Tesh always disrupting the video. Got his brother, Dave Tesh played by Tim Robinson. And they, they come in and debut the version of round ball rock that has lyrics. Have you ever seen that? Ba -ba 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 basketball. Give me, give me, give me the ball because I'm going to dunk it. <laughs> so I was going to open the show like that, but then I decided, no, it'd be a bad idea to sing it. But now I just did it anyway. So what are you going to do? Uh, go after you finish this video, go watch the uh, uh, YouTube sketch. It's it's hilarious. Vince Vaughn is in it. Uh, it, it cracks me up as round ball rock uh, debut or whatever they call it or audition or something like that. But either way, we're going to talk a little pit basketball today on the morning pit. You know the deal. As always, like this video and subscribe to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash pantheleracom. That way you don't miss any of our pit video content. These daily morning pit videos, our weekly live stream that we do every Wednesday night, uh, our, uh, li some live post game shows that we'll start getting into with the hoop season, really diving in, uh, lots of stuff, post game press conferences, midweek interviews, all kinds of pit video content right here at youtube.com slash And it's, uh, that's the place to get it. So make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel and you don't miss anything. We're actually going to, um, you know, we started the live show last week at 8 p.m., did it at 8 p.m. instead of 8.30, and I, I kind of liked that. I think we're going we're gonna to do that again tonight, all right? Our weekly live show this week, 8 p.m. tonight, right here at youtube.com slash panthalaircom. I'll put it on social media and the message boards and all that. Um, we did it early last week because of the West Virginia game starting at 9, but I kind of liked how that set up. It was kind of nice doing it 8 to 9 as opposed to 8.30 to 9.30. So we're doing it at 8 o'clock again this week. Not to uh, keep switching things around, but I think it's a good uh, a good time to do it. So tune in tonight for the live show. We'll talk about Cade Bell's hiring, the latest from the transfer portal and recruiting. We'll talk pit hoops and anything else you want to discuss on the live Panther Lair show right here at youtube.com slash uh, at 8 o'clock tonight. And and it really is whatever you want to talk about because we have the chat screen off on the, the right-hand side of the screen and you can... Uh, you can put your comments and questions in there and we'll read as many as we can. So it's, it's pretty fun. It's a good time. Uh, and I hope you can join us tonight. Did I say tomorrow night? Tonight, Wednesday night at 8 PM <laughs> for the live show. Sometimes my brain gets a little scrambled. All right. Pit basketball, seven and three, you know, three losses coming against, I mean, I don't think there's any question. The three best teams they've faced so far this season. I think Canisius ended up being a tougher test than we expected. And West Virginia, um, less of a challenge than we expected. But overall, they, they've more or less taken care of business against the teams you would think they should be. But they haven't really gone out and, and gone out of their way to beat anybody kind of above that. You know, anybody you... I think if you were to look at, at Florida and you know Missouri and Clemson, I mean, to feel to, to generate a lot of optimism about this team beyond just, wow, look how they're beating up on the bad teams, you, you need to win a few of those games, and they weren't really able to do that. I guess they, they got Oregon State as well. So they, they won that game, and they beat West Virginia. So against Power Conference uh, you know, competition, they're 2-3 and three this season. And, and unlike football, it's, it's not the end of the world. I mean, you have – a lot of games to play here and you can really make your reputation and your resume based on what you do particularly once you get into the conference schedule now we know when it comes down to it if you're on the bubble or you know debating seed lines some of these games that are played in December are gonna are gonna they're gonna loom large and, and I think that was the case last year why did Pitt end up in a playing game well maybe because they got stomped <laughs> by a few games in December and weren't able to finish the deal uh, to win the ACC uh, in February and so you know, these games that, that are being played now do have, um, you know, they have some significance and some relevance in that regard. But overall, I mean, this, this team has and will have a lot of opportunities to sort of tell its story. Now, the Panthers, like I said, they're off this week right now. 
Uh, for finals, they'll be back in action on Saturday against South Carolina State. Then on Wednesday, they close out the non-conference schedule against Purdue-Fort Wayne. And then, you know, another little break there, a 10-day break for the holiday. And then you have Saturday, December 30th, they go to Syracuse for – it's so annoying that we can't call it the ACC opener. The ACC opener already happened for Pitt. They played Clemson, but it was a one-off game with like four more, five more games before they dive into the the ACC schedule headlong. Um, so, But it's annoying because I just want to say, oh, when they go to Syracuse for the ACC opener. But I can't say that because it's factually inaccurate. So it's like, oh, when they dive headlong into the ACC schedule at Syracuse. But either way, December 30th, they go to Syracuse, and that's the start of the AC- of. I can't even say that's the start of the ACC schedule because they got the start of the ACC schedule when they played Clemson. They go to Syracuse, and from then on, it's all conference games throughout January and February. And that's what I think we're all looking forward to. These next two games, South Carolina State and Purdue-Fort Wayne, should serve as uh, you know final warm-ups before they get into uh, the, the real ACC schedule, the full ACC schedule schedule and uh, I, I have to go back and look and see what I predicted Pitt to do in this stretch you know if all goes well against South Carolina State and Purdue Fort Wayne they'll go nine and three um, you know in this pre full ACC schedule it's nine and two in the non-conference I, I think that's probably where I had them about nine and two in the non-conference um, I, I think I probably expected they you know what I, I actually distinctly remember writing that I thought they would split the games in Brooklyn and split the West Virginia Missouri games, which is ultimately what ended up happening. So, Clemson game aside, you know, if you look at the non conference part of the schedule, and if they take care of business in these final two, they'll more or less be on track with where I thought they would be. And I ended up, I think I predicted them to win 21 games, which, you know, if, if you look ahead, if they do win these two games and they go into that Syracuse game at nine and three, to get to, to 20 wins, they have to go, what, 11 and eight? You know, to get to 21 wins, they'd have to go 12 and 7, which would be a pretty impressive stretch and a pretty impressive run. This team is not there yet, right now. I don't think they have arrived at the point where you can expect them to go 11 and 11 and 8 or 12 and 7 over their, you know, the, the, those 19 ACC games. Uh, I, I guess in theory, you know, they could go 10 and 9 right which would get them to 19 wins and then win a game in the ACC tournament to get to 20 or win two to get to 21 because ultimately you know you're you you do count those numbers you know when they start looking at records at the end of the season you can count those numbers now what is you know if they go 10 and 9 over these 19 games that means they're going to be 10 and 10 in the ACC is that going to win the conference is that going to put you at the top of the league no you're probably going to need to win 12 13 14 games to really be in you know to be you know a top 6 finish i have to go back and look at where teams finished last year uh, but 10 and 8 or 10 and 9 uh, 11 and 8 probably you know 12 and 7 in these 19 games coming up these 19 ACC games probably isn't going to cut it but my point is that I think they're more or less on track of where I thought they would be overall in terms of record and, and how they're sort of set up now has the team progressed the way I thought they would or done what I expected them to some points yes and some points no I think there, there are a couple areas that uh, a couple players I, I guess I would say that are probably I don't want to go so far as to say they're the most disappointing we're 10 games in but 10 games in you sort of had certain expectations and I think Zach Austin and Fed, Federico Federico have not been up to the expectations I really I like I, I am disappointed in Zach Austin I I had pretty high expectations for what he would be able to do coming into pit um, uh, high expectations for what he'd be able to provide offensively uh, with the shooting and then using the athleticism to, to make some big plays, some exciting plays at the rim. A and then maybe even more so, oh, and also the rebounding, but then even maybe even more so than that uh, defensively, you know, it, it, maybe it was partially based on, on that interview we did with him right here uh, on youtube.com slash pantholaircom in the summer, July or August. I forget when, maybe June. But he said he felt like he could defend one through five. And I was like, wait, I kind of actually believe this. So like looking at what he did at high point and watching you know the video and reading about his, you know, it, it all seemed, it was like, wait, this guy might actually be able to defend one through five. This is a really exciting guy to watch. A really, you know, interesting. I think I called him multiple times the most interesting man on the team or the most interesting man on the roster. 
And he hasn't lived up to that at all. I mean, the, the game the other night, I think he was subbed out two minutes and one second into the game, uh, in the Canisius game. Let me bring my notes up. Yeah. Zach Austin and Federico. Federico both subbed out two minutes and one second into the game. Not due to fouls, not due to any issue like that, but because they weren't playing well enough. And Jeff Cable, we asked him afterward. Chris Carter asked him about Federico, Federico, what he needs to do better. And I followed up and I was like, well, it's the same, same question for Zach Austin. You know, and, and he just said they need to play better. They need to be more consistent with their effort, more consistent with their focus. And and that's been something Cable has talked about with Austin all season long. That he needs to be more consistent in his effort and his focus. He needs to be focused for long stretches. And I think you see what can happen if he's not. He comes out two minutes in. And, you know, probably facilitating that move even more or making Jeff Cable, Jeff Cable more likely to make that switch is that Will Jeffress is probably the best defensive player on the team. I thought Zach Austin would claim that mantle in addition to be able to provide offense, but instead it's Will Jeffress who has been the best defender. And so if Capel's watching and, and Austin is being, uh, he, he's, he's lagging in his, his defense or he's slacking off or he's not paying full attention or keeping his focus, you've got a guy who's going to do all those things and do them well that you can bring in. And the problem with Will Jeffress is a lot of times when he's on the court, you're kind of playing four on five offensively. He just doesn't provide a whole lot at that end of the court. He'll knock down a shot here or there, but he's not an offensive weapon. You're not going to really run sets for him. And, and usually the shots that he gets or takes, I mean, you're you're looking more at like off second chance points and offensive rebound opportunities as opposed to regular regular offense, you know, flow of, of the offense because there's just not a lot that he has to offer at that point or at this point on that end of the court. And so that's difficult, but you're also not getting a whole lot out of Zach Austin offensively. So if you're going to be four on five with either of those guys on the court, you know, with Jeffers, at least you, you even it up and go five on five at the defensive end. Um, whereas Austin, you might be playing four on five at both ends of the court. And unfortunately, Federico Federico's got a little bit of that going on as well. And this is a guy who came into the season with really high expectations defensively. Jeff Cable multiple times said he thought he was the best defensive center in the conference last year. Well, he hasn't played that way so far this season. And he actually, and not just with level of competition, but just game by game, seems to be taking steps back. Now, I do think he took some steps forward in the second half against Canisius. Like he got better in that half uh, after getting benched early on and, and playing limited minutes. In the first half, he came out and played like 14 minutes in the second half, and I think he was much better defensively. But, you know, here again, Federico is a guy who just doesn't give you much on the offensive end, if anything at all. You might get some putbacks, but it's it's not like they're working the ball down low. It's not like they're running sets through the center position. And I understand that, and I don't know that they necessarily came into this season expecting to be able to run the offense through Federico, Federico, but you need to get more uh, out of him than you are now and you don't need to run the offense through him but when you pass the ball to him it should look like he has touched a basketball before and and I don't mean to, to to poke fun but it's been a real adventure with Federico on offense um, so far this season through 10 games defensively though I, I think it's probably and this is a little bit like Austin it's probably where he's been the biggest disappointment because you didn't really know what to expect out of Federico offensively but you thought he would at least hold up on defense and be a you know rim protector and, and play as well as he did last year. Uh, and it hasn't happened. Cable said he needs to bring energy and, and I think, you know, play with force and, and you know, use a lot of terms that he often uses. Um, but it, it's not happening. And that's that's a problem. And, and so you, you end up with a question that I think a lot of Pitt fans are asking right now of, do you change the starting lineup? Do you put Will Jeffers into the starting lineup in place of Zach Austin? Austin has started every game this season. Do you put Guillermo Diaz Graham into the starting lineup in place of Federico Federico? You know, do you bring Austin and or Federico off the bench? You know, are you at that point now? You're 10 games in. You've got a not small sample size to look at these two guys and say, we're not getting what we need out of you. And we're going to try and mix things up a little bit. 
And maybe it will be good for them. Maybe Zach Austin coming off the bench will be a good thing. Maybe if he wait, you know, he he sits for four or five minutes to start the game and then comes in, and maybe he can provide a little bit of a spark. I thought early in um, see the Clemson. It might have been the Clemson game. I, I felt like he was a real spark plug, like just just a lot of energy all over the court, making a lot of things happen, steals and blocks. Was either the Clemson game or the West Virginia game? I I forget exactly which one it was, but um. You know, I think he showed some of the flashes of energy that he can bring. He's just not bringing it consistently enough. Maybe he can bring it off the bench a little bit better than he was bringing it um, as a starter. Now, the interesting thing about Guillermo Diaz-Graham is I think that what you're seeing with Guillermo and Jorge Diaz-Graham is two guys who so you had the first four games of the season, the, the mid-major competition. And they were a blast to watch. They were all over the place. Their defense and their energy and they're doing all this stuff. And then when you got into some tougher competition, things got really hard for those guys again. And it was a bit like what it was when they were freshmen last year. And they didn't really react to it well. They didn't really respond to it well. But slowly but surely, I think they have been getting better. Not just because they started, you know, you got Canisius again. Uh, You were able to mix, get back to a mid-major opponent. But I think slowly but surely, We've seen those guys take some steps in the right direction. They're, they're getting more acclimated, I think, getting more acclimated to college basketball again. And I thought that last year would have served that purpose for those guys, but I think they've needed a little bit of time to sort of settle in with it. And and I think, but I think that steady improvement they're showing is encouraging. You know, I think they're figuring out how to use their energy, how to use their tenacity, use their their chumbawamba-ness, you know, because they do get knocked down and they get back up again, you know, and you can never keep them down. And so they're able to do that, and I think they're sort of recapturing some of it, you know, and they're knocking down some shots, they're scoring points, they're they're getting after it on the boards, and, and their defense is, is slowly and steadily improving. And so I think, you know, with Federico struggling, Guillermo playing a little bit better lately, not necessarily better than or worse than Federico, but just showing some improvement on his own, sort of independent of anything else. Um, I like. I think it's worth considering a change to the starting lineup, at least for this game on Saturday, the South Carolina State game. You know, Federico's still going to get his minutes. Austin's still going to play, but maybe those guys come off the bench. Hell, maybe you even start both twins. You know, Jorge's been playing at the three. Jorge subs in for uh, Zach Austin. And I think, um, yeah, Will Jeffers was the first sub. Um, um, the other night subbed in for Austin, but eventually Jorge got in there. So maybe he starts. But I think it's it's a real consideration to look at, you know, getting those, maybe making some changes to the starting lineup. Um, elsewhere, I mean, it's not just about these negative things. I think those are the two biggest questions facing Pitt right now is, you know, do you make a change to the starting lineup and how, how do you handle the situations with, with Austin and Federico? But there's not, those aren't the only storylines so far. I do think, you know, Bub Carrington, white hot start, struggles against high major competition, finding a little bit of his confidence and finding his group. And the biggest thing with Bub Carrington is he's, he's just got to figure out how he fits and figure out the things he can do because he was pretty much able to do anything in those first four games. He was able to do anything he wanted in those first four games. And it was great and it was fun and all that. But then, I, I, you know, you went up to Brooklyn and he ran into Florida and he found out, whoa, wait, I can't do everything I want to do. I actually am kind of stuck here a little bit. I need to, ooh. What am I going to do? And, and so it, I it, I think it has taken him some time to sort of figure out what he can do, what he should do, pick his spots, when to make the right decisions, when to pass, when to pull up, when to drive. He's still learning those things. You know, the natural ability is there. There's no question about that. He's just he's learning that he can't just do anything anytime. He's got to pick and choose and make good decisions. And that's the best thing about him. But I, I or that's. A, a very good thing about him, and I think the best part about it is that I think he's shown a better understanding of it, sort of game by game. Game by game, he's picking up little things and he's showing little flashes that he's getting it more and more. Uh, so I think that's that's a positive. I think it's huge for the team going forward. Uh, Blake Hinson is just—I mean—he's been outstanding. He averaged what almost twenty-eight points per game last week uh, when they played three games, but 
you know, I mean, he's he's just on a tear. He's 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 shooting so well. And then a game like Canisius, he only shoots four three pointers. He only made three. He went three of four from outside the arc, and he still scored twenty six points because he went seven of seven from the free throw line. And what did he shoot inside the arc? He shot five of nine from inside. I mean, he just he was he was driving, he was pulling up, he was knocking out shots from outside. He made his free throws when he drew, drew contact. We've been talking about how this team needs to drive more. That 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 Carrington in particular, but also Ishmael Leggett needs to keep up on his penetration and Blake Hinson every now and then. I mean, Hinson's doing it, and when he goes to the free throw line and shoots seven free throws in that game, a lot of that's coming from him driving and trying to score in the paint or draw contact or find someone to kick it out to. It's it's a good sign what we've seen out of Blake Kinson because it does look like he has taken his game to another level this season and become a more complete player than he was a year ago. Um, I would say, you know, I mean, Blake Kinson is obviously the man for this team. There's no question about it. But Ishmael Leggett has impressed me, and it's perfect because his picture comes up here. Ishmael Leggett has impressed me through the first 10 games as much as anybody on this team, I think. Uh, that's not to say he's been better than Blake Kinson. That's not to say he's been more um exciting and breakout than bub carrington it's just to say that he has impressed me more than anyone else uh because i i didn't know what to expect from him coming out of rhode island i i really didn't i didn't know how like i said my expectations were high for austin more so than Leggett. i thought austin would be a big part of this team and Leggett, we would see how he would fit in it's been it's been the complete opposite you know that austin doesn't really have a role and isn't really doing much leggett has become a huge part of the team he is one of the big three on this team with hinson and carrington and at times he's been uh i don't want to say a steadying force because the way he has sort of steadied the ship for the team is by getting out of control and going crazy and going to the hoop uh it, but but it works right? I mean, there's times where they just need to settle down and get a basket. And I think he's been remarkably good at getting those baskets about, you know, driving to the hoop and either drawing contact where he's the best free throw shooter on the team or finishing. And he's been pretty good at that. And he's not bad at passing either. Um, Ishmael Leggett has impressed me as much as anybody this season. And uh, I, I, I think it's going to be fun to watch him get into the uh into the into acc play and then finally we should talk about jalen low i think jalen low is just going to keep getting better he'll have games where he gets minimal minutes in the second half and we we've seen that but i think you know particularly as we get into acc games i i think he's gonna have ups and downs in terms of his playing time but i think overall we're going to see him keep getting more minutes and get more playing time he's going to keep getting better he's getting overshadowed by bub carrington right now uh, and that's understandable because Carrington came out of the gates on fire. But I think we're going to see, we might even see more beginning of the season to end of the season improvement from low than we see from Carrington. You know, I think he's going to be pretty good by the end of the season and really good, you know, by next year. I think Jalen Lowe is going to, uh, he's going to have a role on this team and he'll probably come up big in a couple of games. I, I think there'll be a couple of games where Bob Carrington gets into foul trouble and Jalen Lowe is going to have to carry the, carry the load and he's going to have to lead the team. And, and I think he'll shine when he gets those opportunities. Um, so looking forward to that happening. And I think I actually covered all the topics. Well, I talked about every guy that they're playing right now, right? All uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine guys <laughs> that are uh, in the rotation right now. They're still sticking with that nine-man rotation. We'll see how far it goes, but now it's sort of a question of which guy would get dropped out if you cut the rotation down to eight or seven. Who would you cut out? Is it going to be one of the starters in Zach, uh, Zach Austin? Is he going to start getting the John DeGroat uh, minutes treatment um, for uh, Zach Austin? Don't want to don't wanna throw that out there too early in the season, but he, he got it the other night when he got benched after two minutes. Federico did too. All right, little basketball talk there. We're going to dive back into the transfer portal tomorrow for our portal podcast. We're doing that every week just to talk about Pitt's latest offers in the portal, the latest movement in the portal. Players Pitt has gotten out of the portal since they've got one now. And, uh, you know, some in addition to some other guys that are coming back from the portal, we're going to do all, all things portal on the Thursday edition of the Morning Pit. So don't forget tonight, 8 p.m., we'll have our live show right here at youtube.com slash panthalaircom. Looking forward to that as always. Hopefully you can tune in. And then we'll be back with, for another morning pit tomorrow. So like this video and subscribe to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash panthalaircom. Hope you've had a great week so far. Enjoy your Wednesday, and we will catch up with you tomorrow on the morning pit right here on youtube.com slash panthalaircom.